Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, the corridors of power here in France rocked once again by accusations of sexual harassment directed towards a leading politician. We also talked to American author and journalist Adria J. Simino on how sexual harassment is viewed on both sides of the Atlantic. And months after swimming for her life in the Aegean Sea, how one teenage Syrian refugee now stands the chance of competing in the Olympics. But we begin here in Paris, where hundreds of female politicians have called to end the impunity of sexually abusive male colleagues. This as judges launch an investigation into allegations that Denis Baupin, the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, harassed women in his own party. Denis Baupin, the latest French politician accused of caring more about his libido than his female colleagues. Some eight women have come forward accusing the MP of numerous counts of sexual harassment, everything from breast grabbing to explicit text messages. The Deputy Speaker of Parliament resigned his position in light of the claims, but insists he did nothing wrong. The revelations were met with outrage from the press, with Libération and Le Monde calling for an end to the code of silence surrounding sexual abuse in the workplace. Female politicians were happy to oblige. Before being elected, I worked in construction and banking, hardly feminist environments, but they were both far less macho than politics. One day I wore a dress, simple at the front, a little lower at the back. All my colleagues behind me ridiculed me, saying, oh, she's so sexy, even though it was a very professional dress. This isn't the first time France has been forced to do a bit of soul-searching regarding sexism in the corridors of power. In 2011, IMF chief and would-be socialist president Dominique Strauss-Kahn was arrested accused of raping a hotel maid in New York. Charges were later dropped, but DSK, an acronym that's become shorthand for sexual excess and casual misogyny, did reach a financial settlement with his accuser out of court. More recently, Finance Minister Michel Sapin was accused of pinging a female journalist's knicker elastic. He first denied it and then apologised. Many blame a culture of impunity. When you find yourself in that sort of situation, it's not an interaction between equals. The person sending lewd messages or whose behaviour is inappropriate has the upper hand, an established reputation, more experienced. You go round and round in your head, how do I say no while making sure I'm not blacklisted the next day, that he's not telling lies about me? Under French law, allegations of sexual assault between adults have to be filed within three years. It's not clear how many of the claims against Baupin fall within that time frame, and no alleged victims have so far made formal complaints. Baupin's behaviour will, however, be subject to a judicial inquiry. Now it's five years since the Dominic Strauss-Kahn scandal unleash much soul-searching within the country over the treatment of women, not only in politics, but also in the workplace. American journalist and author Adria J. Simino has lived here in Paris for 10 years and her latest book of fiction is about sexual harassment in the world of high finance, entitled The Creep Show, and she joins me today in the studio. Adria, thanks for being with us. Um, now, with this Denis Baupin scandal, there's a feeling of deja vu about it, isn't it? There really is. It seems we keep hearing the same story over and over again, whether it be in politics or in the corporate world. And every time there's this feeling as if, how could this have happened? It's such a surprise. And yet it's the same story over and over again. Um, the same sort of patterns that we're seeing among the victims and among the perpetrators or supposed perpetrators. Um, it just seems to be a story that never ends. We think that finally one of these episodes is over and it almost as if, it's almost as if we look at it as an isolated event, as if, oh, it's just the DSK thing, but you know, everything else is fine when really it isn't. So has the country changed post DSK? I don't really think so. I think it was really viewed almost as if this is just, this is an isolated event, this is a DSK thing, but really this doesn't happen all the time. Um, and yet there is this underlying, this pattern of what is really going on. And just the whole idea of 
when do you say it's sexual harassment? When do you say it's discrimination? When is it considered normal behaviour? So why is it not changing as fast as it should be? I think a lot of it has to do with general attitudes uh, towards sexuality and, and just the interaction between people here. Um, for instance, uh, there's a proximity, in, referring to the workplace, there's a more of a proximity in the workplace um, between colleagues than there would be in an Anglophone country. For instance, it's it's normal to faire la bise, to give the kiss on both cheeks um, and have that sort of physical contact. So, for instance, if someone came up to you and did that, it wouldn't be considered harassment. Um, so you have to ask yourself, when do we draw the line? Also, people here are more comfortable with saying, hey, that dress looks great on you. Um, you look pretty with your hair that way. That's not harassment here in France. So what is? That's the question. Where do you draw that line? And I think it's, it's a very hard question to answer. And I think that might be one of the reasons why we're having problems finding solutions. Adria, more and more women are entering the workplace. You've got more and more young women mm -hmm. entering the workplace, which is even more important because their attitudes are different. Aren't right. They? Right. Um, I think that younger women are w more willing to speak out and say, hey, this isn't right, uh, this isn't normal. Sometimes in, in the early stages, it's difficult. For instance, if you're right out of college, you really want to keep this job, you really want to have this opportunity. Um, so are you going to really say something if, if something is happening to you? Or are you going to say, maybe what? I should... Why do women struggle so much with coming out and going public about uh, sexual harassment and, and, and abuse? I think part of it is that women don't want to be seen as a victim. You say to yourself, if I say that this happened to me, I will be considered a victim. I don't want to look like a whiner. Um, I can tough it out. I can, I can just tell this person, hey, don't do that, and it'll go away and it'll be fine. But the problem is, even if the person no longer does that to you, there will be another victim down the line. Um, so really it is everyone's responsibility, whether it's sexual harassment, whether it's discrimination of any kind, to say, wait a minute, stop, this isn't normal. But it's not peculiar in France for women to do that, is it? No, no. But what makes it different in France by contrast to the Anglo-Saxon world? I think in France, uh, it still is, there's, there still are those views um, on sexuality, or the views on human contact that are a little bit different. In the United States, for instance, um, there isn't that close contact all the time. So it's easier to tell what's right, what's wrong. Like, this doesn't feel so normal that my boss said this or did that. Um, whereas here in France, you say to yourself, oh gosh, this is part of our culture to maybe faire la bise, to give the kisses on the cheek. So um, if someone says something else to me that's maybe complimenting me on my dress, is that wrong? Is not is it not wrong? It's and personally, as an American, did you struggle with that when you first moved here? I did. I did at first. It seemed when I would see things, not in every workplace, in my own particular workplace, there wasn't the kiss on the cheek, but I'd seen it before when I was doing an internship here. I saw it. It was a daily thing. And I've seen it in other friends' workplaces where people will do it daily. Um, and at first, it just seems kind of, it's it's kind of funny. And it never seemed to me like harassment, but it was just, um, it was just kind of interesting and different. And get, it was something to get used to, to see where the lines are drawn. Adria J. Simino, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annette. And finally, a tale of ultimate bravery. Last year, Yusra Mardini, an 18-year-old Syrian, was one of the hundreds of thousands who fled to Europe by crossing the Aegean Sea. After the boat broke down, the professional swimmer took to the water to help steer it towards the coast of the Greek island of Lesbos. Now in Germany, she's hoping to qualify for this year's Olympic Games as part of a special refugee team. Following her dreams, this summer, 18-year-old Yusra Mardini could be headed to Rio. She's among 43 candidates pre-selected by the International Olympics Committee to form a team of refugees and compete against the world's best athletes. Yusra has been swimming since she was three years old and her passion may have saved her life. Last August, she fled Damascus and embarked on a rubber dinghy to Turkey with her sister. But the engine broke during the crossing and the crowded boat threatened to capsize. Yusra, her sister and three others dove into the water and pulled the dinghy to safety. They swam for over three hours. I am an athlete. I am a 
uh, swimmer, that's why I think uh, I'm alive and that 20 people are alive in this uh, sea journey. It's gonna be a big shame to like drown all of us. Yusra was arrested several times, but her unwavering determination eventually brought her to Germany. And despite a traumatic journey, her passion for swimming never faded. Since a local club offered to let her use its pool, she's been practicing six hours a day. Training, she's really good and she's doing very well and um, yeah, she surprised me every time. Swimming has also helped Yusra fit in. She now leads the life of a normal high school student, even if she's still struggling with a few things. Learn German. <laughs> it's really hard. Despite making huge strides, Yusra isn't guaranteed to compete in Rio. But the young refugee is determined to give it her all. And if she doesn't make it, her eyes are already set on the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. It's not important to be German or Syrian or under the uh, Olympic flag. I think the important thing is in the water. A passion that knows no bounds, Yusra's story has become a source of pride for many refugees and an inspiration to follow their dreams. And that's it for now. And if you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page. That's 51% hyphen France 24. Or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. And please keep those comments coming in. So until our next program, bye for now.